Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker this evening, Dr. Tyler Vanderweel. Tyler J. Wan Vanderweel is the John L. Loeb and Francis Lehman Loeb Professor of Epidemiology in the Departments of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and also director of the Human Flourishing Program and co-director of the Initiative on Health, Religion, and Spirituality at Harvard University. He holds degrees from the University of Oxford, the University of Pennsylvania, and Harvard University in mathematics, philosophy, theology, finance, and biostatistics. His empirical research spans psychiatric and social epidemiology, the science of happiness and flourishing, and the study of religion and health. He has published over 300 papers in peer-reviewed journals and is the author of the books Explanation and Causal Inference and Measuring Well-Being. Tyler, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and it is a pleasure being with you all this evening. Um, I was asked by the Love and Fidelity Network to talk about the science of human flourishing and to discuss some of our research at Harvard at the Human Flourishing Program. And that is indeed what I will be doing this evening, but I would like to do so with a particular emphasis on human relationships, on family, on love and fidelity. And so I'll briefly discuss what it is that we might mean by human flourishing, our own efforts to try to form at least a very crude assessment of flourishing for the purposes of empirical research. Um, but then I'll also talk about activities that one can participate in and communities that one can actively join in order to enhance one's flourishing and also that of others. And I will conclude with some remarks on the importance of families for flourishing. Uh, more information on the work that we're doing is available at the Human Flourishing Program uh, website, and uh, as well as in a couple of these papers on uh, the promotion of human flourishing and the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and a recent paper on some of these activities for flourishing that I will be discussing later in this evening's presentation. So what might we mean by flourishing? Well, if we turn to our academic disciplines, we, we often see uh, very grand visions of human flourishing present. So the World Health Organization's definition of health from 1948, still in place today, is that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Economics is sometimes conceived of as an attempt to study how agents maximize their expected utility, supposedly taking into account all aspects of the agent's preferences. The discipline of positive psychology has sometimes been defined as the scientific study of the strengths that enable individuals and communities to thrive. But in practice, in our discussions and our actual studies, often these are restricted to, to very specific disease states and health or very simple measures of positive affect or happiness within psychology um, or, or simply measures of income uh, within economics. Um, so if we want to return to a broader vision of, of flourishing and to think about how we might go about studying and even assessing it, uh, we, we need to give further thought to this concept of flourishing and to what reasonable assessment approaches might be. So if we turn to our dictionaries, um, the Oxford English Dictionary defines uh, to flourish as to grow or develop in a healthy or vigorous way. Uh, the American Heritage Dictionary, to do or fare well. The etymology of the term comes from Latin, florere, to bloom, blossom, or flower. Uh, it's all the you, that you, word that's sometimes used to translate Aristotle's eudaimonia, sometimes also translated as happiness. Uh, the definition, working definition that we've been using at the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard has been that flourishing or, or complete human well-being is living in a state in which all aspects of a person's life are good. This is arguably what we're after as individuals and, and ought to be after as a society. But with a definition so broad and expansive, we, we might ask the question, how could we possibly ever go about assessing such a thing? 
There have been numerous measures of well-being put forward in the positive psychology literature, and I think this is the discipline uh, that, from an empirical perspective, has has come closest to to trying to study uh, what it is that we might mean by flourishing. But notably absent from the very many measures that have appeared in the positive psychology literature are health. And are we really flourishing if, if, if we're not healthy, if we're physically ill, if, if, we're, if we're bedridden? Um, also often missing from these measures um, are any notion of virtue or character, uh, contrary to Plato, Aristotle, the vast majority of the Western philosophical and theological traditions, and really philosophical and religious traditions worldwide. Um, so, so these measures that we do have, while of some value, are missing. Um, some of the important aspects of well-being or flourishing. But with a conception so broad and a concept that's so rich, we might wonder, is it ever possible to achieve any consensus? Is it ever possible to go about measuring um, such a thing? And I certainly believe that the conceptions, any adequate conception of flourishing, really is going to differ across um, philosophical or religious uh, or, or cultural traditions. I think there are real disagreements and discussions and important ones um, o- over what really constitutes the good life, what constitutes flourishing, what constitutes living well. So what we tried to do in our own assessment work is to focus on aspects of human life that seem common um, to most of these traditions. And so what I would propose is that um, there are at least five domains of of human life um, that any reasonable conception of flourishing would include. Not that we can reduce flourishing to these five domains, and and any reasonable conception of flourishing would indeed be much richer, um, but that for any reasonable conception of flourishing, whatever else it might include, it would include these five as well. And these are happiness and life satisfaction, physical and mental health, meaning and purpose, character and and close social relationships. Again, the argument is not that these things exhaust what we mean by flourishing, but each is probably a part of it. I think each of these domains also satisfies the following two criteria. Each is nearly universally desired. It's, um, and we have empirical data on, on this now as well. Um, and each also constitutes its own end. Um, It's sought for its own sake. It's not merely a means to achieve other ends. And I think these two criteria, um, being an end and being nearly universally desired, uh, might help shape consensus around what to measure. And so as a very crude measure of um, human flourishing, we've proposed uh, two questions drawn principally from the existing uh, well-being literature in each of these five domains. And I'll briefly run through uh, what these are so that you can have a sense as to the the sorts of questions that are guiding some of the empirical work I'll be describing later on. In the happiness and life satisfaction domain, we have first more of a a cognitive evaluative question. How satisfied are you with life as a whole these days? Zero, not at all satisfied. Ten, completely satisfied. And these are are all self-rated. And then something more effective in general, how happy or unhappy do you usually feel? Again, scored zero to 10. Then with physical mental health, we've chosen two questions from uh, numerous surveys from the World Health Organization, the US General Social Survey um, for physical health in general. How would you rate your physical health? Or for mental health, how would you rate your overall mental health? Again, widely used questions. Uh, In the meaning and purpose domain, one on one's activities, overall, to what extent do you feel the things you do in your life are worthwhile? And this is, in fact, one of the most widely used well-being questions in the empirical literature. Uh, But then second, also some cognitive. Uh, I understand my purpose in life. Zero, completely disagree. Ten, completely agree. The character and virtue domain um, was the one domain where uh, these, these questions were newly proposed and, and developed in um, collaboration with, with philosophers, but also simplified and refined uh, through cognitive testing. Um, and essentially, these are drawing upon uh, notions of the cardinal virtues that at the foundation of all moral virtues lie for practical wisdom or prudence, justice, 
fortitude or, or courage and temperance or, or moderation. And the first question is very, very crudely trying to um, in some way assess justice and practical wisdom. I always act to promote good in all circumstances, even in difficult and challenging situations. Uh, zero, not at all true of me. Ten, completely true of me. And then second, um, I'm always able to give up some happiness now for a greater happiness later, intended, again, in some very crude way to try to get at uh, notions of fortitude and temperance. And then finally, in the fifth domain uh, for social relationships, um, I am content with my friendships and relationships, essentially trying to assess the, the, the quantity or extent of those relationships. And then second, my relationships are as satisfying as I would like them to be trying to assess the quality of those relationships. And these were drawn from the UK's Campaign to End Loneliness survey of, of measures as being particularly suitable for short assessments. So we could go on to the next slide. When we use um, these questions, uh, we, we typically look at each of the domains separately, but we will occasionally uh, average over uh, the questions as a very crude measure. Um, though, though really it should be conceived as nothing more than the average of these five more, more meaningful uh, domains to, to, to give a score of, of, of zero to 10, to try to understand what is it in human life um, that can shape and promote flourishing. In our work, we also typically supplement these 10 questions with, with two additional on financial and material uh, stability. Um, and uh, while these really are means rather than ends, uh, we think these questions are important in, in assessing whether flourishing is going to be likely sustained over longer periods of time. And these questions were drawn from the financial well-being literature. Uh, first, how often do you worry about being able to meet normal monthly living expenses? And then second, how often do you worry about safety, food, and housing? Uh, zero, worry all the time. Ten, do not worry at all. Um, and we'll average all 12 of, of these questions. Um, to form kind of a more secure measure of, of flourishing, probably less satisfactory conceptually, uh, because each of uh, these is, is really a means rather than an end, uh, but perhaps helpful in practice to assess whether flourishing is likely to be sustained over time. And um, we've been using this work for uh, research, which I will be uh, describing shortly, but I think these questions are, are also helpful in the lives of individuals and of institutions. I think they can provide an opportunity uh, for, for self-reflection, for, for self-assessment, uh, for trying to assess what is going well in life and, and what is not, for trying to identify areas of, of improvement or, or changes that one wants to make um, in life, or at both the individual and at the institutional level for, for, for tracking uh, well-being over time, to try to discern um, what's improving and what is not. And so with that, I am, in fact, going to take a very short break if we go back two slides and allow you to reflect um, on, on your own life, uh, to go through these questions here, to think about your life, to think about what is going well and what might not be going well. Um, so we'll spend um, about two minutes uh, for each of you to, to reflect um, on, on these questions, and, uh, and then we'll move on to, to talk about um, how these assessments can be useful in discerning um, how to promote flourishing. Um, so I realize this is a little bit more awkward online than it would be in, in person, uh, but I do think some time a pause for, for reflection at this point might indeed be valuable. So I'll give you, give you all two minutes uh, to, to think about these questions as they pertain to your own life. So I think we will, we will move on, but hopefully you've had a, a brief opportunity um, to reflect on, um, on, on your life. And when we've done this in practice and we've done this in educational settings, um, in workplace settings, if we could go back to slide nine, please. Um, and uh, in, in, in medical uh, settings and in, in, in communities in Columbus, Ohio, um, in, uh, 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 we will be doing this in Wuhan, China shortly. We, we've um, collected feedback from this and we've gotten a variety of, of responses. Responses like some questions made me stop and think or it was pretty eye-opening to see the areas that I really need to work on. Or a sense of relief that someone is asking, I want help in certain areas. 
Um, some of the questions, especially around meaning and purpose, have, have prompted reflection. I'm slightly caught off guard with the questions around purpose. I, I'm missing a greater purpose. Need to reach out to help more uh, and to give back. Personally, I find it helpful every so often to, to go through the questions uh, my, myself and to identify what, what has been changing in my own life. And we've, in fact, been trying to do this at the national level also. Um, and we have data now on what is happening during the COVID-19 pandemic with regard to nationwide flourishing. Unsurprisingly, uh, flourishing on the whole uh, has, has gone down. But what's very interesting is that it differs rather substantially across these different domains. So in the happiness and life satisfaction domain, um, the scores have gone down from about seven uh, to ne nearly a full point to 6.2, a pretty substantial decline. Likewise, in, in physical and mental health, uh, nearly, a, nearly a full point. And the largest fall was with um, financial and material stability. Uh, again, much a full point uh, decline. And these, these are pretty substantial declines. It would be to move from the 50th percentile in the distribution down to the 37th percentile. But this is happening on average for everyone in the nation. Um, so we do need to be concerned about these declines in various aspects of flourishing. But also interestingly, some of the other domains have been much less affected. The declines are much smaller for meaning and purpose, uh, essentially unchanged for character assessments and um, very little change as well for close social relationships. Um, the variance of each of these has gone up during the pandemic. Um, and, and so experiences are variable. Um, for some with social relationships, for example, those who are socially isolated, this has been a difficult time. There have been real declines. But for others, it's allowed for investment and family or a housemate and, and, and their well-being in the social domain has, in fact, gone up. So we can use this to try to study what is taking place as individuals, as communities, and as a country um, in terms of people's well-being. But we might then also wonder, well, okay, we can perhaps assess well-being, but what can we do uh, to improve it? And that's what I will be spending the second half of this presentation on, um, ways in which we can enhance flourishing. Um, and when uh, Brittany from the Love and Fidelity Network asked me to speak, she, she wanted me to talk a little bit about what individuals can do. And so I'll spend a bit of time uh, describing some of the activities uh, for individuals that promote flourishing. But then I'll go on to talk about the importance of communities and of family. Um, so this is, in fact, this question has been uh, fairly well studied within the positive psychology uh, literature for, for a number of, of, of years. And people have developed different interventions or activities. Activities that one can do on one's own uh, to, to enhance well-being. And these have been assessed and studied in, in randomized trials, the same sorts of designs that are used to determine whether drug A or drug B is more effective. These same sorts of study designs have been used to study different ways that one can enhance one's own well-being. And one of the best studied of these um, activities is, is gratitude. A simple thing like three times a week write down three things that you are grateful for and why, um, has been shown in randomized trials to increase levels of happiness, to relieve uh, symptoms of depression, to improve uh, sleep and, and, and self-reported health. Um, and um, it's, again, something that one can easily do a few times a week. Um, my, my wife and I try to do so over, over dinner uh, with some frequency. And, and, and when we forget for a while, I, I do notice uh, the, the difference. So this is, again, something very easy to do, but brings one's mind back uh, to what in life is good. Another one of these uh, easy-to-use activities or, or interventions concerns uh, acts of kindness. Um, and this has likewise been studied in, in randomized trials. And, and the idea here is to select one day um, each week for, for six weeks, say, select one day and try to carry out five acts of kindness uh, that you wouldn't otherwise uh, ordinarily do um, and, and carry this out for six weeks. It, it actually takes some effort if they're all going to be concentrated on, on the same day. It takes some effort and planning to think about uh, how, how to carry this out. Um, but likewise, um, participating in this activity versus something much more neutral um, has been found to, to, to have effects on improving one's happiness, to, for relieving uh, symptoms of, of, of depression and, and um, achieving a greater engagement uh, in, in life. Um, other uh, interventions include kind of identifying one's, uh, one's central character strengths and 
um, Penn's Center for uh, Wellbeing has a, a tool to, to do this. And, um, and then once a week, try to use each of your top five character strengths in, in a new way. Uh, likewise, effects even six months later on, on, on happiness and on, on, on relieving um, depressive symptoms. Uh, so, so, so these things are very simple to, to, to implement. One can make it a part of one's uh, daily life and practice. Um, there are also various resources to address aspects of, of psychological um, distress. And um, in cases of severe anxiety or depression, um, professional counseling and, and care, I think, is very important. But for more mild symptoms, there have been workbooks that have been developed uh, to, to address depression. David Burns' Feeling Good book is one of the best studied. Likewise, has been examined in multiple randomized trials and has found effects on alleviating depressive um, symptoms. I, I remember reading this as a graduate student and, and when I was going through a difficult time. And um, it, was, it was very helpful in my own life. Um, likewise, there's a similar book on mastering one's uh, anxiety, and that, that, that's been found to have effects. There have been workbooks that have been developed uh, to promote forgiveness. Um, and, uh, and these, too, have been studied in um, randomized trials to help people who are struggling to forgive, who want to forgive, but because of persistent um, anger, aren't able to do so. Um, and we're, 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 in fact, examining the efficacy of these workbooks now in, in five different countries, in, in Colombia, South Africa, Ukraine, Hong Kong, and in Indonesia, uh, to, to see if they're um, effective cross-culturally um, as well. But these are simple, easy-to-use uh, workbooks. They take about three, three hours um, available on Everett Worthington's uh, website. Um, and, and these are the books we're, we're trying to, to, to study to see if these two can be used to promote flourishing. Um, and, and so these activities uh, for flourishing, I think, uh, can be uh, helpful in promoting different aspects of well-being. But what's interesting is almost all of the effects are either for happiness or for health. And if we turn to the other flourishing domains, um, purpose, character, meaning, uh, the, these interventions seem much less effective, and the positive psychology interventions that have been designed to try to improve purpose have generally been un unsuccessful. And so I think for these other domains of human life, um, we, we need not just individual activities, but we need communities. We need uh, relationships. And so that's what I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about now. And we've been trying to study at the Human Flourishing Program the, the, the pathways to promote and not just happiness and health, but all of these various domains of flourishing. And we've been approaching this through a public health lens. And in my own discipline, which is public health, the way we assess the public health impact of a particular phenomena or exposure or intervention is through two, two ways. Um, first, we think about how prevalent is the exposure or phenomena? How common is it? And second, how large are its effects? on the outcomes that we care about. If something is very common and has large effects, then it's gonna shape population health. So if we think about physical health through this lens, um, we end up with the important factors shaping physical health like exercise or nutrition or not smoking or sleep. But we could also apply this lens, not just to physical health, but to all the domains of flourishing. We can ask, what are the pathways that are both common and have large effects on all of the domains of flourishing, on happiness, on health, on meaning, on character, on close relationships. And based on our, our, our literature review of the most rigorous studies, uh, the studies that are, are using longitudinal data, I, I would pr propose uh, four domains. You can go to the next slide now. Um, and those four domains, or pathways rather, to promote flourishing are family, work, education, and religious community. There is strong evidence from the most rigorous empirical studies that each of these is relatively common in the population, both in the United States and worldwide. Um, and each also has large effects on each of these different flourishing domains. The claim here is not that these are exhaustive, that these are the only pathways to promote flourishing, um, nor is the claim that they're necessary. One can flourish even in the absence of one or more of these pathways. Uh, but each does powerfully affect flourishing. And if individuals and, and policy efforts were made to try to enhance these pathways to enable them, flourishing would increase. And so I want to talk a little bit more about 
um, how this relates specifically uh, to families and, and how families themselves and how marriage contributes to human flourishing. Uh, we can move on to the next slide now. Um, so the vast majority do, of, of, of people everywhere do grow up in some sort of family context. Um, and, and most, uh, not all certainly, but most do go on to, to get married. Approximately 80% of Americans 25 or older um, will at some point get married. Uh, that data is a little bit old, and there's some indication that that, that number may be declining um, in the future. But again, it's very, very common participation in family life, participation in marriage. Um, and marriage itself has been found to be associated in, in, in rigorous longitudinal studies, including in our own work, um, with, with, with happiness and, and life satisfaction. Um, strong evidence for physical and, and mental health that marriage contributes to, to longevity, both for men and for women. Um, some evidence for meaning and purpose, though this is not as well studied. Uh, likewise, for, for, for character, um, we just don't have very good measures in most of the existing studies, which we are at the Human Flourishing Program trying to change. But, but clear evidence that um, marriage typically leads to reductions in, in, in crime, for example, especially for at-risk populations. Uh, clear effects on uh, promoting uh, greater um, social connection, uh, lowering loneliness, uh, promoting greater social support, um, and, and much better financial outcomes uh, as well. Conversely, divorce is associated with poorer outcomes in each of these domains. And these effects are even larger for those um, than with regard to marriage. And yet larger still are the effects um, of, of, of divorce on, on the lives of children. Um, strong evidence that in each of these domains, uh, a, a divorce, the ending of a family life, uh, has, has negative effects across these different human flourishing domains. So it is important, it is critical, both as individuals and, and as a society, to reflect upon how can we sustain and promote um, love and faithfulness within marriage. And so I want to talk a little bit more on the next slide about the um, efforts that can be made to promote uh, family and marriage. I think one important approach is to uh, eliminate uh, marriage penalties in the welfare uh, system. Um, some states have their welfare system structured so that if uh, two people who are together get married, their welfare benefits go, go down. And, and this discourages them um, from, from becoming married. And this is problematic from a societal perspective, given all of um, marriage's uh, benefits. So I think it's important that we, that we remove these marriage penalties from the welfare system. Uh, I think another uh, potentially promising approach to, to promote flourishing within marriage and within families is the use of uh, early and online uh, marital counseling. Um, marital counseling often takes place when relationship is already in a great deal of trouble. Some people use it just to justify uh, a, a divorce. But there's evidence, again, from randomized trials uh, that, that certain um, forms of marital counseling, even online, early on, can be helpful in sustaining uh, a marriage. Often people don't engage in this because it's expensive or they're embarrassed to, to seek help. But these, these online marital counseling programs might help address this and, and would be widely um, uh, be possible to widely disseminate. Um, I think another possible approach is to alter norms around entering marriage. Um, right now in the United States, it's often assumed that one will have um, a big expensive wedding. And, and so it, marriage is often viewed as, as sort of something that happens after you've achieved a great deal of success uh, um, in, in life or, or, or financially. I think if we could alter the norms uh, around marriage and what a wedding ought to, uh, to look like, that could likewise uh, increase uh, um, marriage uh, taking place and not discouraging people who might otherwise marry. Um, I think encouraging and studying positive parenting practices, family dinners, and, and styles of parenting that, um, that both exert um, a, a certain authority and, and, and control and discipline, but also, and importantly, are accompanied by love and caring and nurturing. Um, so these are some of the things I think we can do at a societal level to promote um, family to promote marriages, but but of course there are also important individual uh, practices. Faithful sexual practices very clearly uh, promote flourishing. If we could still go back a slide, please. Um, and um, so evidence from from rigorous studies that that for example the number of of sexual partners uh, predicts uh, poor subsequent relational communication, um, less sexual satisfaction long term, um, and and greater rates of divorce. Less uh, marital stability. 
uh, and fidelity divorce, again, profoundly detract from uh, flourishing. Um, I think another way we can promote flourishing within families as individuals is, is by practicing uh, forgiveness. And um, I think within the context of marriage or of any close relationship, there are always going to be wrongs and we need to cultivate um, forgiveness, the replacing of ill will towards the offender with goodwill in all of our relationships, uh, but in marriage uh, as well. And so we've begun to try to study um, not just individual flourishing, uh, but, but family level flourishing as well. To what extent are the relationships within a family good? To what extent um, is the parenting proficient? To what extent are there healthy practices in sustaining family life? To what extent do people find um, the, the, the experience of community within that family satisfying? And to what extent do families themselves have uh, a, a strong mission? So that work is still in its very early stages, but we hope to study flourishing, not just at the individual level, uh, but at the family level as well. So we can go to the um, the final slide now. So, so I talked a little bit about how um, you know, families themselves and marriage uh, is a powerful pathway, not the only pathway, not even a necessary pathway for a given individual, but as a, at a societal level, a powerful pathway to promote uh, individual flourishing. I've talked a little bit as well about how we can promote um, flourishing within uh, families, uh, both uh, with regard to societal policies and efforts, uh, but also with respect uh, to, to actions individuals can take. Um, but I would like to conclude this evening by talking a little bit about how, how family life it, itself should be conceived of as flourishing, not just a pathway to flourishing, but as flourishing itself. Um, if, if we turn to the um, Jewish and Christian scriptures, uh, we, we, we read in, in Genesis 1 and, and this account of uh, the, the, the gods creating the, the heavens and the earth, uh, that, that when, when, when in, the, in this narrative account, when, when God creates man and woman, he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Um, so really, the, that, that notion of being fruitful, of having children, of, of, of multiplying, is embedded um, in, in these religious accounts of flourishing, really right from the beginning of, of these scriptures. Um, and, and so I, I think as, a, as individuals and as a society, we need to come back to this notion that children themselves are a part um, of vision for flourishing. Of course, Flourishing is, is dependent upon having life, and, and there is no way to have, to have human life without, without children, without childbirth. Um, and, and so really we should conceive of having children as, as itself um, flourishing. There really can be no uh, future society. There can be no flourishing within uh, society uh, without children. And I think we need to, to come back to, to, to that vision and that children are not viewed as something, a distraction or something that detracts from one's well-being, but they are part, an integral part of one's well-being. I do think some of the reason um, there are these sort of modern hesitations over this idea are some of the studies looking at children and happiness. And, and there, the, you know, the, the associations between the two um, are, are ambiguous, with some indication that uh, parents, especially parents with, with young uh, children are, are, are less happy. And having two very young children my, myself, I can understand how this takes place um, sometimes. It does turn out that that varies a lot across countries and depends in part about um, and the systems in place to help support families uh, and mothers and, and fathers in, in their parenting. Um, but again, the relationship between children and happiness is, is, is somewhat complicated and ambiguous. But I think the effects of children on other aspects of flourishing, not just happiness, but on meaning, on the building of character, um, on the formation and the creation of, of relationships are profound. And so I think when we take this flourishing lens and extend it beyond just happiness, uh, we can see the profound contribution um, of children to, to our, our own flourishing and our own lives as well. Um, I, I think parenting also involves sacrifice. Uh, parenting involves giving up, in some aspects, one's own good for the good of others. Um, but that is arguably part of what constitutes love. And thereby, in um, many religious traditions, and certainly my own Christian Catholic tradition, um, it is integral, the central part of uh, true well-being and, and our final flourishing. So I think we need to reevaluate um, 
the role of children um, in, in, in our lives. We need to reevaluate metrics like, like GDP and, and is this really the right way to think about uh, flourishing? Um, if, because of that metric, I, th I think the work of parents is often discounted, but really that work is what is enabling uh, society to go on uh, and to thrive. I think having children is one of the most profound forms of flourishing, and I really believe that little contributes more uh, to societal flourishing than raising children well. And so I think we need to reshape our, our vision of the role of family, of the role of children in thinking about uh, flourishing as individuals uh, and as a society. I think family and marriage, love and fidelity uh, make profound contributions to human flourishing and are constitutive of human flourishing as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler. That was um, such a wonderful, profound talk. I'm always so grateful for your work. Um, so now we are going to uh, take some questions from our audience. And before we do that, I just want to remind everybody that you can drop your questions right now into the chat box on whatever platform you're using. So like if you're on Facebook, just use the comment section below the video. If you're on YouTube, just drop them into the chat box to the right of the stream. If you're using YouTube on your phone, it's under the video. Um, so I've got a question picked out for Tyler, um, but I just want to note that there's still plenty of time for you to get yours in. Um, so yeah, just take a minute to get your questions into the chat. And remember that if you're on Facebook, you can hit the like button uh, to like the LFN page. And if you're on YouTube, you can ring the bell and subscribe to LFN. Okay, so for the first question, which is from Sarah, um, do you think a life of leisure is something we should aspire to? Are leisure-filled people flourishing people? I, I think that that is a very, very good question. And, um, you know, I, I tend to think about the role of, of leisure in, in flourishing in, in two ways. Um, one of which I, is that I do think some degree of, of leisure is, is, is necessary to, to pursue um, different pathways or, or forms of, of flourishing. Um, I, I think some degree of, of, of freedom, of time um, available um, is, is needed to, to, to adequately engage in uh, relationships, um, to, to pursue one's own learning and understanding, um, to, to have time free to help those in need to, 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 to develop uh, greater virtue. So I, I, think, I think leisure, I think time that is free, that is available, is, is, is essential um, to pursuing um, these various other forms or pathways towards flourishing. Um, but, but I also think there's a sense in which um, leisure is, is, is constitutive of, of flourishing also. Um, once again, from, from my own uh, tradition, Catholic tradition, I think being present with um, and, and silent before and, and, and contemplating God um, it is in fact um, the, the highest and, and the final uh, form of, of flourishing. And for that, uh, leisure is not simply um, necessary, um, but it is part of flourishing itself in that regard. Right. So it's not just watching TV. Uh, you'll get no argument from me there. Um, so you were talking earlier about sacrifice and suffering and, and parenthood and how that can be a part of human flourishing. And I guess that just makes me want to ask you, what does it feel like if you're flourishing? You know, if, if you're quarantined with your kids and, and things are really rough, um, but you know that it's good for you. I mean, what should we think about the subjective side of human flourishing, especially when, you know, things are a little bit rough? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's a, a difficult question and one that many people are, are struggling with today. I mean, as you've seen from the statistics in many of these domains, the well-being or flourishing has, um, has, has indeed gone down. And I do think it's important to, to recognize those losses and to acknowledge them um, as uh, as real losses, I, I do think suffering, think um, sacrifice is um, is always giving up some good for sacrifice, giving up some good for a higher good, and and so I think when we are in the midst um, of, of suffering, it's important to acknowledge that loss, but but then to reflect on and think about what good might come of it. How might I, I myself? Uh, grow in in character. How can I seek to do good, even when I myself am struggling or am un, 
unhappy. Um, and you know, I think that that sort of uh, um, uh, approach and that way of thinking about uh, suffering is is universally applicable. But I do think suffering is one of those topics where there's a great deal of disagreement across how to view this as part of flourishing in the different religious um, traditions. And, and I think it's important to acknowledge uh, the, those those differences. Um, you know, I, I think. And from my own standpoint, from my own tradition, I, th I think suffering is, in fact, necessary to achieve that, that final flourishing um, uh, with, with God. And, and that helps me through these times of difficulty, um, of suffering. Um, but, but again, I think it's always also important to acknowledge the, the real losses that, 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 that are present, not, not to ignore them. And, you know, as best we can to figure out how, how to address them as well. Wow. As you might imagine, I totally agree with that. Um, well, anyway, thank you again for your wonderful talk, uh, really just full of insights. 